Welcome into episode 108 of 11 Personnel. Nick Roush and Adam Luckett coming at you in the first week of August. You can smell football in the air. Players are reporting to camp. Media day is Friday. Luckett, football is almost back. Yeah, I got a little pep in my step back from vacation. Calendar turned to August is officially a football month. Football practice will be going on. Football games will be played. Week zero, Nebraska, Illinois, get it ramped up and rolling. In Kentucky this weekend, we get media day, and then we get a little bit of an open practice there on fan day on Saturday. I don't, I'm not really sure how that's going to look, um, but football is here, man. And now we – now, like like in the offseason, it's all about guessing and, oh, this will look like this or prognostications. But now we get to actually, like – we get to go to practice and we get to have takeaways from stuff we saw, like actual football stuff instead well, of just guessing. Uh, why could you, you I, I appreciate well, the if, we, if they let us go to the open <laughs> practice yeah because I'm I'm still uh I was anticipating hearing some like concrete news on fan day on Monday it's Tuesday at 2 12 p.m we still have not gotten any confirmation one way or another what's going to happen on Saturday from my understanding it's going to be an open practice at Kroger Field I hope that's the case because it's better than nothing it gives us a chance to watch every single Will Levis throw. It gives us a chance to watch Wondell Robinson do a little work in person for the first time. Uh, and it just gives us a chance to see the team back in action. So I, I hope that's the case. Uh, I'm going to be happy and excited to talk to some of these guys Friday morning at UK Football Media Day uh, here from Mark Stoops. So uh, there's, there's a lot coming up. I, I feel weird. This is going to, to, to peel back the curtain a little bit like it. For our listeners out there and, and the readers on KSR, most preparation ever done ahead of a media day or a preseason month. Normally, it's just mm -hmm. like, well, football is coming. Let's just write a bunch of stuff. And yeah. you just throw it against the wall and see what sticks. We're actually having a coordinated effort to give you all some preseason content. Hopefully, that it, it turns out good. I don't know. Maybe planning's for losers. But we're at least <laughs> in that phase right now. And I think before we get into the nitty-gritty – we need to talk about what we're looking forward to most of this preseason camp. There's a lot on the line, a lot at stake. Right. And no doubt. Uh, it, it's going to be a very fun, highly anticipated camp. Like it. What are, what are some of your, let's go through some of our favorite storylines. Yeah. Right? What, what, yeah. What's the storyline, Adam? Look at, I'm, I'm not going to gonna take, I'm not going to take the low hanging fruit, the quarterback. Oh. I'm not, I'm not getting on that, man. <laughs> uh, for me, I think a big part of the defense is kind of the defensive backs and the secondary. Devontae Robinson, I think, is a huge part of this defense this year. And he wasn't himself last year. So, for me, like last camp, we heard about how he was still going – they were still taking it slow with him. He's still not fully himself, yada, yada, yada. For me this year, I, I want to hear – I want to hear good things about him. If he's if his name is coming up a lot, I think in training camp from Brad White, from Stoops, from some other coaches, I think that's going to be really good things for the defense because I, I think he's a guy that they're going to be able to move around and play in a lot of different spots, whether it be a deep safety nickel or maybe as like a Sam linebacker in some dime looks. I think he's very important to the defense. So for for me, that's going to – big thing I'm looking at when the games start, I want to see how much they're going to more five, six DBs um, this year because I think it could be a lot more and for the big part of that is going to be Robinson and his flexibility so that that is mine that's the one the number one thing I'll be looking out for I think this spring you're going back to your nickel sub package aren't yeah. you <laughs> yeah you can't let that, that I'm that, not letting it go no can't let that go I uh did not expect Devontae Robinson's name on the board because like you said we didn't hear much about him last year I'm shocked that his first off the board if I was if this was like an actual draft and we were trying to have a competition over who would pick the best storylines you fell flat on your face, buddy. So just letting you know that even if Devontae – the only way you wouldn't is if Devontae Robinson has a great year and kind of plays to the recruiting pedigree we all anticipated from him. Which I think could happen, so that's why I picked it. All right. Well, I'm going to take the little hanging fruit because I might as well. We can't, yeah. we can't spend five minutes talking about the preseason without mentioning some quarterback competition. And the quarterback competition somehow got a wrinkle thrown into it. We did not anticipate going into camp that you would hear, oh, Joey Gatewood's making a push. Because let's face it, they've just been working out to this point. 
uh, throwing routes on air. You know, there has been a lot timing happening. with all the the Gatewood stuff too. The comments. it seemed weird like two weeks before camp starts. So here's the thing: there's either a concerted effort to make sure that this is a quarterback competition, right? There's it, it could be a way to motivate Will Levis to do more which might make some people worried that Levis isn't doing what he needs to at this point, Mm -hmm. or uh, it's simply the fact that Joey Gatewood has actually just been good (laughs) with his teammates. Or Levis could maybe be struggling with the playbook or yeah, there, whatever, you know? So there, there's, there's a lot out there that we don't know. Hopefully we get to see more in this practice. Uh, Not, not only just how do they look throwing the football also, moving around in the pocket, running the ball, using their feet. It, but what I'd probably going to analyze more instead of throwing mechanics is just the general, how they conduct themselves with their team within the offense. Sure. It'll be basic stuff towards the beginning of camp, but Mark Stoop said that this competition is going to be won by whoever gives the team the best chance to win at the end of the day. And a lot of that is just making sure the offense stays ahead of the chains and mm-hmm. can produce a big play or two here or there. So that's what it's going to come down to. We're going to get a lot of uh, whispers about what happens at these scrimmages. Oh, yeah. And th- that that's what I'm going to be waiting on bated breath for, not necessarily this upcoming Saturday, but the, the 15th and the, the 22nd, mm-hmm. whatever those dates are, uh, when we get some scrimmages, that's yeah. when we'll hear, okay, these guys led scoring drives. Not necessarily – completed all the pat but these guys were a part of scoring plays i think that's what's really going to to move the needle for me in this quarterback competition yeah i mean we won't really know until the game comes but if uh if they get out of the first scrimmage and no n- neither one of them have kind of taken the reins i could definitely see both of them playing to start the year oh man you know what they say about two quarterbacks like it yeah yep. so i mean well i mean we'll see with all that goes but i still think it's going to be levis um I, I kind of believe it was the first thing they they wanted people to think it is a competition mm-hmm. that he just wasn't handed this job uh, but we'll see I mean you never know what could happen I mean Gatewood if you just look at the recruiting profile I mean it's a top 100 recruit mm-hmm. what if the light just came on you know he, he, he was probably the most talented overall but I mean Levis does has a big time arm and he can make a lot of big throws so it's going to be very interesting um, to see how that goes. And, yeah, it's going to be something that we talk about nonstop, obviously. Right, right. And, and we should learn a little bit more about Levis. I mean, at this point, we've just got a 25-minute interview with Curtis Birch on the Behind right. Kentucky Football podcast. And Levis, he, he sounds like a quarterback. He fits the bill. Uh, but he and he also has that kind of pretty boy quarterback look about him, you know, and his modeling poses and stuff like that. And so I don't – you know, I call me anti pretty boy, but yeah, I'm anti pretty boy. I is this because if, if this was an episode of first take like it, I, we would have the picture of Levis jumping and throwing, saying, Does he care too much about what he looks like? I think it's bad for Kentucky. Like, and th- that would actually be a lot of fun to have those hot takes. Not willing to have those yet, but rest assured, we're going to get some of those throughout this preseason camp. Oh, no doubt. Um, there's going to be a lot of good stuff going on, and we're just going to be too busy talking about quarterbacks. <laughs> it's going to take a lot of oxygen, though. Right. No um, what's some more of the good stuff that you're looking forward yeah. to? Like it? Wide receiver three. I mean, we know Ali. We know Wondell Robinson. Now with the heating up Shaw news, I think that puts more pressure on that wide receiver room. So who are the guys that step up? I mean, is Magwood, Chauncey Magwood, we heard some good things about in the spring. Is he a guy that can really – Take a big low this year. Can Isaiah Epps, his redshirt senior season, make a jump? Demarcus Harris, can he make a jump? Tay Tay Crooms is a guy Mark Stoops has talked about a lot. Can Chris Lewis get involved in there at all? So to me, that's going to be a position to look out for and name what names we hear pop up throughout the fall camp because obviously that's a big big spot for the offense. And in this kind of goes hand in hand with the quarterback competition, but the Saturday insert players here made a big play is good fun fodder it doesn't necessarily translate into production in the fall and in in instances of both i'm going to be hesitant to give any sort of stamp of approval to either quarterbacks or this wide receiver three until i see it on saturdays there's a difference between doing it against your own team in a scrimmage setting versus doing it against an opponent so uh I, i'm going to be hesitant to be completely sold on either of these things 
I'm going to be a doubting Thomas, but I, it, it's nevertheless, I had it right up there with one of my more important things too, because no no you, you, you can't just win with just two receivers. So, uh, but my, for my number two, my biggest, second biggest storyline, it's all going to come down to, I think the biggest question mark and really the only significant question mark I have from this defense is Havoc plays Kentucky. There we, we had Bill Connolly's SP plus preview come out today about the Wildcats and that's something that has been lacking. I, I don't have the stats pulled up right now, but after the Josh Allen year, their, their sack rate uh, was like 112th or they're, they're, just their Havoc plays in general were ranked in the bottom 25 of the Yeah, they FBS were like 113th year. in sack rate last year, I believe. Yeah, and there, there was some other one of those advanced analytics stats too that they didn't fare very well in last year they just didn't make a lot of plays behind the line of scrimmage now it didn't matter because they got a ton of interceptions led the sec and were second or third in the nation but Mm -hmm. you can't rely uh, there's a degree of turnover luck that kentucky had last year jerry Jerry garantano ain't walking through that door okay Mm -hmm. uh your boy from mississippi state who i already forgot his name he got beat out by will rogers he ain't walking through that door either. They aren't just going to give you pick sixes. So Kentucky's got to find a way to produce a pass rush. We know that J.J. Weaver has the ability to do that. How healthy is he going to be? That's going to be a question, Mark. Jordan Wright, he is a guy that is good at getting to the quarterback, but not necessarily getting home. And let's be honest, the front three, as good as they've been at stopping the run, uh, the sacks haven't been there. Calvin Taylor had a great uh, 2019 season. But they need Josh Pascal to play at a level they were talking about this spring and then get a little bit of something out of that three tech where uh, is it going to be Octavius Oxendine? Is it going to be Justin Rogers? Is it going to be a Bule? You know, we don't know what we're going to get out of that position. So creating a pass rush is imperative. Brad White said last year, knock on wood, don't think I'm going to be having to talk about pass rush as a problem for us this year. And then look what happened. So nope, that, yep. that can't happen again this preseason. Yeah, I mean, the pass rush is a big deal. I just don't know how much we'll hear about it. I mean, that's just going to have to be a thing because you can't sack the quarterback in practice. They're just going to have to go out and do it in a game. You know what I'm saying? I what mean, if just, you could sack the quarterback in practice, though? That, you could. It, it's pretty you wild. You got to go full uh, green light on Nick Scalzo. It's, it's off pretty wild to think about, like, like when Freddie was playing, that they, they didn't give them – different color jerseys like you could tackle the quarterback in practice that that's just so, such a foreign concept to me mm-hmm. they also used to eat salt pills so that, yeah we've come a long way but yeah, yeah and, they, and then even this year you know, they've laid they've uh really the ncaa has cut back the live periods you've, you're only allowed to have two scrimmages but i think that's what kentucky has just pretty much done mm-hmm. for since stoops has been here at least and still struggled to to avoid the injury bug so uh fingers crossed that they they've gotten their season ending injuries out of the way by now but um look it what else do you got for us i've got one more storyline do you got one yeah more for i've us? got i've got yeah one or i've got wrote, wrote two more down but we jj i mean this one kind of goes with yours so i'm not going to include it like jj weaver weaver's health mm-hmm. and then mine is just isaiah cummings at tight end Ooh. How does that – what does that look like? Or, you know, does he bring something extra to the tight end room that gets the coaches excited? Um, that is a huge development for me because I think he has NFL potential at tight end. Um, I think he can – he's a good enough blocker. They can use him in certain ways. And I think especially in the red zone, you can split him out maybe in the slot or at X receiver, isolate him on one side or get him lined up against a smaller – you know, nickel defender or whatnot, um, and just let him go to work on some specific type of routes. And then he, you know, in high school, he was a great, you know, jump ball catcher to his basketball background. He was very good at bodying off defenders, um, like going up for a rebound and high point in the football. So he's a guy that I'm pretty excited about. Um, I was worried about that, but now that they're moving him down, I, I think tight end can still be a pretty strong position for the team. The thing with Upshaw's loss that hurts the team the most is, yes, Rig and Bates are both quality tight ends, but neither not the of the passing game value right. exactly. Neither mm-hmm. of them have that game breaking juice, that wiggle that that Cummings can bring to the table. But their positional versatility, specifically, and especially, I think Upshaw in the red zone. We saw it some last year what he was able to provide the offense. 
and especially in this kind of attack, it was just going to be big. And then he was going to kind of be the guy on those over routes off play action they were going to probably use. And I think it really stung. I think Cummings can do some of that. Yes. Um, and I think that's going to be a big deal. I think he's a guy that if the light comes on and if he's able to adjust quickly, he's going to be a guy I think is going to have a pretty pivotal role in the offense. Man, I was – it was one of those things that I was happy to hear the news. I was happy to break the news because that's – here. here's the thing. Cummings was always going to be – like he, he needed to become a tight end to reach his full potential because the days of the big X wide receiver, you look at the NFL draft, the days of the big X wide receiver are done. I mean, Julio Uh, Jones, the guys who can do it though, have that killer straight line speed. When you look at guys like DK Metcalf. Yeah. Some of the others, like they're just freaks that can really, you know, just get vertical. I mean, there's only like with Cummings is he struggles to create separation. Right. Yeah. yeah. There's, there's not many players that can be that size and have that amount of speed and explosiveness, but he still has a lot of skill. Uh, One of his strengths was a blocker. Like it was, it was a natural fit to move him to tight end. Glad the staff is making this move because that's a position that, that takes a beating, you know, you, you got to be able to move a lot of guys yeah. and, and to have an extra body in there is important. I think it'll help Jordan Dingle's growth to his development mm-hmm. because yeah, you it, can, you, you can take your time with Dingle. Exactly. So th- this, I think was a, a significant move it, Cummings. I saw him this summer. We saw him at the camp over the summer. He's really developed. Uh, he's hit the weight room hard. I think this is going to be not only best for that room, but best for him long-term. And mm-hmm. it, it really, I, I'm still optimistic that Kentucky can run a lot of 12 personnel stuff because, like I said before, I'm questionable about what what can happen in that wide receiver room. Yeah. But I'm confident in the tight yeah. ends and and Cummings. Uh, that move, it it it, I, I I still believe that they can be a big strength to this team. The point I always brought up: I went to watch Isaiah Cummings a senior year play at St. X, and the first three series they used him as an inline tight end, and he was kind of anchor in their run game. He brings value as a blocker. I think when defenses maybe see him come in the game, if he's ready to play for Kentucky, they're going to see former receiver. They're going to think 11 personnel. They're going to be more willing to get in their nickel package. Mm -hmm. And for Kentucky, they can move him down inside and they can get advantageous numbers in the box, and then it can help their run game and then help the play action. Mm -hmm. Um, So I think there is going to be an advantage, like a schematic advantage there potentially if he's ready to go. I think he's – now that that he's there, I think – you know, it's a lot of pressure I'm putting on, like, a redshirt freshman. Mm-hmm. Um, but I just think he brings some value to the offense that they really need in this attack. And, it, like, I don't think it's crazy to see – like, I could see him – if if the, the light came on and it hits, I could see him third on the team in receptions. Yeah. No, I mean, I, you're, you're talking about third on the team probably on these 20 to 25. Yeah. Um, if Ali and Wandell are getting most of the share. Right. Like I think he could be in that mix. And then going into next year, 2022, then you really have something. Um, oh, with him and Upshaw. In. Well, <laughs> and, and, Bates. and Bates and Dingle. I mean, yeah, you really man, that's, yeah, just go yeah. 13 personnel. Screw it. Yeah. Who needs wide receivers? <laughs> yeah, Kentucky exactly. doesn't. Yeah. Um, so that's exciting. Glad CJ Conrad's in the room to help him along with Vince Merrill come along. The, the final uh, big storyline that I'm looking forward to is who is going to be Chris Rodriguez is running mate. The smash and dash, the thunder mm-hmm. to – or the lightning to Rodriguez's thunder. Is it going to be smoke rocking the zero this year? Or is Jatan McClain, has he worked his way into that spot? And I also want to know how much they're going – like we're probably not going to know in the preseason how much each player is going to be used. But that was a big point of contention last year was – all right, Rose is getting these carries, and then it's Rodriguez. Like, Skill talent utilization for sure was a big issue with the offense last right. year. Right. And, and Cole Kublik, in a conversation I had with him down at SEC Media Days, if you haven't watched yet, check it out on the KSR YouTube page. Subscribe. Enjoy all of our fantastic footage from there, which are really going to crank up this football season. But he mentioned that he believes that not only SEC teams, but in particular – Kentucky will probably use the two running back sets a little bit more this year. And yeah. if, if McLean smoke can, can show off that pass catching ability a little bit, then you, you can really keep defenses on their heels. So I, I I'm going to be curious who gets the most, 
who gets the most uh, sound bites of the two between McClain? Yeah, snap counts are going to be interesting to follow for us this year in that running back room. Yeah, and especially because we knew Eddie was a big fan of McLean. Fans have always been a big fan of Smoke. I think it's in partial because of his name, but also no like one out of every five carries is a huge gain. Uh, obviously, durability has been a factor for him. So that that I as good as Chris Rodriguez is, it's equally important as to who's going to be the the guy splitting mm-hmm. carries with him. Yeah, uh, when you look at Smoke, the efficiency numbers just dropped off the cliff last year. He went from a forty eight. 0.51 percent success rate which is pretty good to 34.04 percent which is nearly kind of unplayable you can't have that now the explosive play rates kind of stayed the same um, but he just was you know you were getting a lot of second and eights when you ran with him on first and ten stuff mm-hmm. like that um, so that's that's got to change and durability has always been an issue for him he does bring that home run factor um, but last year he was like a baseball hitter um, that he was hitting a couple home runs but the batting average and on base was just not good enough you couldn't it hurt to have him in the line. It hurt you to kind of have him in the lineup, especially for an offense that had no passing game to start with. Um, so we'll, he needs to get more consistent. I think that's a big um, thing for him. Now, McLean, we've heard good things about, but we really haven't seen it yet. So we got to see it in the game. Now, what I think you're going to see, Nick, I think you're going to see some 21 personnel, two running mm-hmm. backs, one tight end, two receivers. Mm-hmm. And you're going to see Smoke and McLean both operating out of the slot. And they're going to have a lot of motions like that Push jet sweep in. action. They're yeah. going to be used a lot and they're going to be used a lot on jet sweeps. Yeah. They're going to motion them in, motion them out, motion them in late, maybe run a screen, stuff like that. I think it's going to kind of get the creativity you're hoping um, that Liam Cohen is bringing in from the NFL. And I think that's what you're going to see with them. Um, that that 21 person you're talking about, we called it flex back in high school. We turned a wishbone offense into a, yeah, two running backs next because you can you can do a lot of different stuff mm-hmm. where it just confuses the defense. Well, Obviously, it's apples yeah. and oranges, high school to, but but you can employ a lot of misdirection, especially mm-hmm. if they want to get versatile in the running game with pin and pull stuff. I know it was alluded to with Coach Wilford. We really only talked about the outside zone stuff. Yeah, they're uh, going to use some of that. I think until now, but like that stuff can be huge. Where not only with the two running backs, but also with the quarterback. I mean, yeah. as much as we talk about the passing game, these guys got legs that they should be able to use it. So, yeah, and it um, it's a, it's a schematic move too because defenses have to decide: are they, there's two running backs on the field? Do we want to get big or do we want to get small? And if they want to get big, you could put Smoke or McLean in the slot, and whoever's a better route runner could, you know, you're going to have a one on one if you can run it, you know, a little angle or glance or slant route to get open right quick. It's going to be an easy pitch and catch. Mm-hmm. Um, so that's just kind of the chess game of football. So it, that's something going to be interesting to follow. Um, I think it's good that we've heard that stuff so far. We I still need to see it um, for right, Cohen, right. like in an in actual game when bullets are flying. But <laughs> oh, but yeah, that's Eddie Graham when the bullets are flying, buddy. Mm-hmm. <laughs> but I, and and I think too, I don't. We don't need to necessarily stop with our storylines. But that's the one thing that does stink about all of these storylines is even though we will get more clarity, there's still an aspect of projection where we just got to believe what they're telling us. Yeah, especially with Cohen. Like, Cohen, there's just a lot of unknowns Mm -hmm. um, with, like, this McVay offense, like, Nick, I think it could be, like, the thing. Like, it could be, like, you know, it could come in and take over college football, and it could be, like, why weren't we doing this before? Let's go hire this, this, this guy. Or it could fall flat on its face. I mean, there's a lot of, we don't don't know. There's, you know, there's a big window here of, things that could go you know a hundred different ways um and we won't really know until it happens and i think best case scenario is the former where it's uh the most successful thing ever and we're lucky to have cohen for two years and then he goes on to the nfl and becomes an offensive coordinator there and you say you know what thank you mr cohen because if it hits well that's what you want that's what you want exactly and if that works this year you're not getting this schedule ever again. The way conference realignment is right. going, you are not going to get this gift wrapped up in a bow where you play a bad South Carolina team on the road. You play a bad Vandy team on the road. You got LSU, Florida reeling a little bit at home. And then Jordan, you, you got a tough October, but the rest of it, you can win. So this, the time is now. And if you can strike this year with Liam Cohen, getting this offense rocking and rolling, man it's going to be fun 
Yeah, I mean, I think the winner of the Kentucky-Missouri game has, like, the inside track to the Outback Bowl. Like, the winner of that game is going to probably oh, man. Is Blue a very great, on New great Year's shot Day. at going eight and four and then maybe even getting even better or even higher. I hope they serve Bloomin' Onions in the press box. I'm just going to eat house one <laughs> in the middle of the game. Yeah, I, Greasy, I would not hate just a, gre- Grease will be all over the keyboard. Throughout. I would not ha- hate playing golf in Tampa on New Year's Eve. Oh, man. Sounds but, great. Um, but, yeah, I mean, I just think you, it, it's hard to get around it. And CBS released rankings. Kentucky came in at 35. Mm-hmm. They released those on Monday. But the 35 is not important. It's the schedule and who they play. Like Mississippi State's in the 50s. Louisville's in the 60s. Missouri's 47. Vanderbilt's in the 100s. ULM, New Mexico are five, uh, two of the five worst teams in college football. Mm-hmm. South Carolina is in the 90s. They, they just have a golden opportunity this year um, to take advantage of their stability, take advantage of the division's instability. And then if you can pick off one of the big three in the in October, you've got a chance. I mean, the, the, the chance is there to have a really good season. Um, you you got to let it, you know, play out. But mm-hmm. like you're entering a year where Kentucky's going to be a favorite in eight or nine football games as of right now. Which is unheard of. Like we right. used to four years ago, we were like, all right, they're favored in four games. What games can they pick off to get to six, get to seven? And they're walking into a season where they're legitimately going to be favorite in seven, eight, nine football games. The Wildcats play five teams projected 90th or worse in S and P plus. The time is now. The yeah. time I mean, is the now. The schedule is football. I mean, it's a butte of a schedule. <sighs> and like that's like we talked about storylines like we're going to talk about specific like positions and stuff in camp, but that to me, that's the thing of the season is mm-hmm. the schedule. Like they have a great schedule here. It should have been eight home games because they were supposed to get Louisville at home this year. They still if have eight Col- home games, right? Yeah. They still have eight home games. No, they have seven. They have at, you might be right. Let me, let's work this out. At Mississippi at South State. Carolina, at Mississippi state, at Georgia, uh, at Vanderbilt at Louisville. Yeah. Uh, Louisville, I, I forget it's not a home game because yeah, they own Cardinal Stadium. You yeah, know. Okay. Yeah. Uh, nice. I like easily how mistaken. Yeah. Yeah. But happens. yeah, you know, like it's just, they've got a chance here. And if they hit on quarterback, it's going to happen, I think. Like they're going to have a big year if they hit on quarterback. <sighs> And and that's really the the big picture because like you said we're gonna we're gonna get into the the odds and ends throughout the season we got a bunch of position previews coming up but that's the 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 pressure is going to get cranked up as we get closer and closer to the season and if you win that Missouri game it, it's it's all on the table it's there for the taking um, yeah you win that Missouri game and it's like just beat South Carolina and get Florida in your house mm-hmm. undefeated. And let's start the and let start the three game run and see what happens. Uh, we mentioned Isaiah Cummings to to tight end. That was one of the big stories from this week. Before we recorded, Chris Rodriguez tweeted out that he is getting vaccinated, which uh, you know doesn't seem like a, a normal. Like I, I guess it's something now that's kind of hot in the streets. Um, you know, it's something you kind of need to talk about, but. He's, he he kind of you you could tell he was reluctant initially like you know feels like I'm signing my life away but hey for the team and he said I I wasn't forced to get it I got it because I wanted to I missed two of the biggest games last year I say for the team because if I miss a game I'm letting them down and you know wherever your beliefs are I I think that Rodriguez his decision to get vaccinated it really echoes the sentiment Nick Saban shared at SEC media days. I'll read you all the quote. Every player has a personal decision to make to evaluate the risk of COVID related to vaccine. And then they have a competitive decision to make on how it impacts their ability to play in games. Because with the vaccine, you probably have a better chance. Without it, you have a lesser chance that something could happen Mm -hmm. and a bigger chance that something could happen that may keep you from being on the field, which doesn't enhance your personal development. Essentially, there are risks. You can hurt your draft stock by not getting it. You can hurt your team. You can hurt your draft stock. I mean, those games that he missed against Florida and Alabama turned into blowouts. But you talk about draft stock. If he is still putting up the 6.6 yards per carry against those teams, 
he can show that I, that matters well, a lot. It also you're probably you not getting be, blown out when you don't if you, if you don't lose your best offensive weapon. Well, the Florida game is a different game, totally. Yeah, yeah. I um, mean, he's not RB six at media days. If you try to play in those two games, <laughs> yeah, yeah. So, um, in in, I'm I'm happy that it like it hasn't turned into a big, like, um, too big of a hubbub, you know, like, but it and it's also. It, it, I, I know that folks are very sensitive when it comes to vaccines and COVID, and uh, you, you, you throw stuff like that on Facebook and people lose their minds. But it really is one of those things that, yes, it's a personal decision, but every decision has its consequences. And are you willing to live with those consequences? And I'm happy to see that Chris is buying in for the team. Kentucky was not one of the six schools that was above that 80% vaccination threshold a couple of weeks ago. I have a feeling that along with Rodriguez, there's going to be some other guys that are just like, all right, screw it. I'm going to get this shot before the, the preseason camp gets started. Cause I don't want to miss any time. Yeah. I mean, I think by the time the season kicks off, I think you'll see most of those sec teams above that threshold. That's mm-hmm. just kind of what I feel. I think college kids maybe make decisions later than normal people. Really? And, think, and then I think what Rodriguez never procrastinated in college, not what Rodriguez really. just said was, um, I think it's important to, um, take into account like guys who are like preparing themselves for the NFL like that's going to make their decision a lot easier like well, I don't want to miss any games this year this is the only f- way I can fully guarantee that I won't miss games outside of an injury I'm going to go ahead and take it so I mean we'll see how it breaks out but I have a I think most of those teams are going to be over 80 percent uh, I believe so as well um yeah I, I just I know Chris isn't the biggest fan of interviews and I just, I hope he's prepared to answer those questions on Friday. <laughs> he's going to end up getting a lot of them. Um, but, yeah, uh, but I mean, he can give the canned answer, man. It just be like, this is my personal decision. Mm-hmm. I, I'm preparing for the NFL. And this is the best way. Um, I can guarantee that I'm going to be able to play and I don't want to let my, you know, my guys down on the team. Felt like I let them down last year. It was out of my control. This time I can control it. Mm-hmm. Just repeat that answer five times. <laughs> and then if they don't know, just ask them. I don't know what 12 personnel is. <laughs> and just direct them my way. Oh, uh, Speaking of, I don't know, 12 personnel, Darren henshaw has got a new job. He does. Heading back home. Yeah, going back to UCF, going to be an analyst. <laughs> you know what? I, bus. The first thing I thought of when he went to the UCF, I was like, man, those are two guys that aren't the best at scheming up a pass game. <laughs> <laughs> I would not – I don't know if you want to go to passing game clinics down there. Oh, that was my first thought. Oh, Dylan Got, Gabriel Gus Malzahn, a chance. <laughs> he's great at the run game. He's great at scheming that up. But that passing game, the rinky dink, and we saw what happened with Kentucky. Oh, man. This past year. That was my first thought. I was like, man, yeah, Dylan Gabriel. I don't know if that's exactly what I would want. Man, the uh, – Kentucky's best finish in the last three years – in past defense nationally, it was 115th back in 2018. Or, excuse Passing me, past offense, offense. Yeah. yeah. I mean, and those are raw numbers. That's not even that. I've been sure, analytically speaking, it's even worse. Yeah. When it comes I mean, to, like, like, success rate. We can get into this command. I mean, it's the biggest bad. problem, Nick, was just they couldn't recruit the position. I mean, we could we can go – that at bad and receiver. Um, and that was, was probably, that was probably more of a problem than, you know, it was more Jimmys and Joes and X's and O's, I would say. But that's also on the court, you know, the quarterback coach and coordinator too. Mm-hmm. And so that's why that have made a change. So um, you don't Henshaw's... hear about the Gus Malzahn rehab clinic much, though. So <laughs> no, that, that, that no. it's not the, quite the same as the Nick Saban rehab clinic for coaches. But um, good for Henshaw. Familiar settings. He uh, he had the school, all the school's passing records until yeah, Blake Bortles let it up, and then. Um, I guess was Milton the other guy that was he the quarterback for the national championship team that UCF had? He was. I'm sure he's got records and stuff now, but Henshaw is Florida per- State now. Henshaw could uh, could light it up in his time. So, uh, and now he's he's breaking away from Grand. Grand's just chilling out this year, collecting some of that severance. So, uh, you know, he'll be doing just fine. But um, you know, I wonder if Eddie ever regrets hitting hitching his wagon to to Henshaw. Yeah, 
I mean, I mean it's it, probably the, that's it, a million it, dollar question, right? It worked in the American, and he's going back there. So you know, uh, I think even Stoops alluded to that. Yeah, well, I think like, you know, did find Stephen Johnson. Yeah, yeah, and that saved a lot of their jobs. Was that whole development? Um, it just it just didn't work out after no, that. No, did not it's work. Bottom out. line. Speaking of not working out. Uh, something that I thought had already happened, but apparently hadn't. Jeremiah Caldwell decommitted over the weekend. Uh, he was Kentucky's first commitment in the class. And stop me if you've heard that before, but the first commitment in a class decommitted. Right. It, I mean, it's kind of confirmation what we heard from Stoops when he was when Klingscale left. He was pretty much like, we're going to recruit other areas. He said, we're recalibrating our recruiting. Right. Which, which like, pretty much eh, might as well sorry, say we're, we're not going to be recruiting in Detroit anymore. Yeah. Uh, so it, 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 it checks out. It makes sense. And I think for all intents and purposes, I, I think in a, on a related note, uh, around that same time, uh, Kentucky offered PRP's Elijah Reed, uh, a kid from Aspirations, works out with Chris Vaughn, Keontae Goodwin, you know, that, that whole crew over there that's produced a ton of talent. He got his first offer. And what I found interesting, like, yeah, yes, he's he's a, he's a lengthy DB, so he kind of fits the mold. He's got a lot of tools, and he's really raw. He, I mean, he just, for crying out loud, he just switched to defensive back this spring. So, uh, you know, I, I watched him do some one-on-ones at the gym, and he def, he can he can lean on, all, like, his just length to get him to bail him out of some stuff where he's just going to mess up. But um, you could see where he would be a nice – he could be a nice late take in the class. They're like, you know traits. what, we need to take him for traits and see what you can develop him if you take him. Yes, yes. But what I found to be even more like the like the big picture of this story, not even from a Kentucky exclusive you know, a UK standpoint, but this is a kid who he should be done with high school. He was he was supposed to graduate. Mm-hmm. Uh, he reclassified. He took advantage of Senate Bill 128. There's a lot of bills like that across the country who have passed these laws that allow you to redo a year of school. You can do the fifth year, fifth year high school. Yeah, to do COVID 19. And for a lot of folks, like, you know, when I first heard that, it's like, dude, I cannot imagine doing that but i also didn't get went, a, it wasn't a real experience yeah so so first things first they, they they obviously didn't get a real experience but also my high school i i, I had 66 kids in my class you know I, i'm still close friends with a lot of those guys have been close friends with them for 20 years so it's a little bit different when you're going to a public school like prp that's one of the biggest in the state you got 2,000 kids like for him he's he said he told me it was like it was a no-brainer like i i to go to school for one more year to make my dreams come true, it was totally worth it. So I'm glad to see that some of those guys that, you know, he he could have used last summer to go to these camps and test well and have some coaches get some looks at him. He didn't get that. Instead, he's reclassifying. He went to those camps. He got an offer. And now you're going to see some other uh, schools in the region, you know, Purdue's going to keep a close eye on him, Cincinnati, Michigan State, Louisville, um, the – those places are going to yeah. give these kids a second chance. Yeah, they're still wet. He needs to have a big year on the field, right? Um, but but if that comes, he's going to be able to go play ball. It's, it's kind of like the kid five. from uh, Beachwood, who yeah, could, that's who I couldn't think of what school that was, but yeah, he could become the first. So he was co Mister Football with Jagger Burton. It's only given to seniors. He's going to be the first ever Mister Football to p- return. <laughs> so, and I believe um, Ty Bryant has reclassified. Yeah, he's dropping down to 2023. So mm-hmm. I'm curious if he was like younger for his grade. Yeah. Um, but that's probably I, what it was if I had to guess. Probably like a July birthday or something. Yeah, I do know too. Like it was it. So each different school board around Kentucky has different rules. If you do this in JCPS, you have to. You cannot. You have to take the classes that you took the year before online. So all of these oh, kids. Wow. Yeah, because they're like, oh, you want to redo your school year? Well, you're redoing your school year, by God. <laughs> so uh, I, I think it's in that sense, it's going to deter. Like, you're not going to see this rash of kids just reclassifying all over the place because for some, it, it affects their yeah. credits and their graduating situation. <laughs> I, think most, all that. I think most are ready to get out of high school when yeah, it comes. So I, I do too. Um, but look, at, I wanted to bring up one more recruiting thing too. 
um, because here's a here's some quotes I wanted to give you. Um, oh, this is uh, from Ron Delmer. I felt like they just recruited out of state guys, Moreland guys, ten minutes away from their home. That Who was, said this, Ron Delmore? This was just kind of disrespectful to me. Yeah, that was Ron Delmore. Stephen Heron said they never came out to the school. It just seemed like they were recruiting out of state dudes better than they were recruiting me and Rondale. Remember how mad people were that that they were Louisville fans? They were like, "How can they say Bobby Petrino? He, why would he? <laughs> what an incompetent jerk! He didn't know how to recruit. The, the next guy surely can't be as bad." And you know what? Scott Satterfield said the doors are closed. No one. burn bridges was the term we heard with the high school coaches with Petrino. And this was December 2018 story in the Courier Journal. Mm -hmm. I have found that interesting too. That no one's really talking about that, but he's—they're not even trying to recruit the state, for lack of a better term. Oh, for the most part, nothing's changed. Nothing's changed whatsoever. Mm -hmm. Louisville doesn't care about kids. I mean, they have a gym that is recruiting. They're producing power five talent. I mean, this gym is, uh, you could hock a loogie and hit Cardinal Stadium from right. it. It is right down the street, and they aren't showing up. It is hilarious. And UofL, thank you. Thank yeah, I you bring for up being so bad at your jobs. I bring up the male hilarious incompetence. Uh, the male high school story all the time, man. Can Kentucky getting anybody out of there is just like crazy. That's a Louisville factory. Anybody that's a legit prospect should be going to Louisville. Like that's it might as well be University of Louisville High School, and they did. Isaiah Cummings went to Kentucky, grew up a Louisville fan. Vinny Anthony is good enough to go to Wisconsin. And Louisville's not really recruiting him. He's a nope. receiver in class twenty twenty two. Sayla Brown. Yep. Um, now Louisville's still in the running, but it should like he should be wrapped. In, that should be a done deal up, already. Right. Yeah. The fact that it's taken this long, and that it's been it seems like it's been kind of slow played or whatnot, just kind of where I'm from my 64,000 seat point of view, but yeah, like I, that's the story I bring up all the time. Like if Louisville's right, that, that that's just a pipeline and that's where they're going. And it's just, you know, it's, boom, it's, boom, boom, boom there. And, and you even look to the 2023 class, William Spencer, four star kid from mail who mm-hmm. unfortunately he's got a shoulder uh, injury, probably not going to play for the Bulldogs this fall. He's going to be a, probably a, a four star defensive Lyman about it's all said and done. Six five three fifteen. Uh Kentucky prediction, crystal ball. Same thing with Micah Carter from St. X, another big kid, defensive end, really talented. Mm-hmm. Where okay, yeah, they got a wolf offer, but like it is it is shocking to me the amount of attention they don't care. Like they, they it and you know what? It's it was hilarious at the time because all of the Louisville slap dicks were saying, you know what, that Petrino, he was an idiot. He didn't know what he was doing, blah, blah, blah. And they were saying it after he was gone. You know, yeah. it was, it was no, I broke up with him. Or I, I broke up with my girlfriend. Yeah. She was a bad girlfriend. They were saying it after the fact. Yeah. It's happening again, and they're not yeah. saying anything. I, yeah, I'm kind of, I the, the whole in-state, or really Louisville recruiting, I just kind of scratch my head and be like, like, this is like, you know, if you're not, if you can't recruit, like, if you're in a metro area, in the power five and you can't recruit your metro area <laughs> you're out of what what, what are you doing man i mean like what like like, miami should be able to recruit doing? miami right pittsburgh you know, should like, be able to recruit pittsburgh yeah I, it, oh my god it's yeah and this is the point where i almost don't even want to say anything because i don't want to draw attention to it well it's just it's a very um it just smells like a g5 operation like um we can't get the best of the best so we're just going to kind of go find our guys, find our fit and go, you know, be selective, I guess, about who we target and who we oh, offer. Um, but I just don't think that's the right strategy to have at Louisville. Like Louisville should shoot for top 30, top 35 classes. Like they, they legitimately should shoot for being like the fourth or fifth best recruiting team in the ACC. Like they have that potential. Huh. Potential. But that's potential. Satterfield is just, I mean, they're, they're mm. doing fine in recruiting, but the, the, the whole, uh, just the 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 in state it just makes no sense to me. And man, Kentucky just keeps reaping the rewards. So yeah, well done, I mean Vince. it's been good. It's been great for obviously it's been great for Kentucky. They've never really recruited the city of Louisville. 
like they have. Um, and like we went and talked to Jawan Northington, uh, manual kid. I mean, he's right across the street. Yeah. And Louisville and just hasn't offered he, him for whatever he, reason. He showed up with a Louisville shirt to a KSR interview. Uh -huh. It was like more props to you, buddy. Like, <laughs> yeah, I mean, he's, yeah, it seems like he's begging for it, but <laughs> you know, Oh man. Um, uh, well, okay, did you see the video of the, the Texas state Senator just burning? I have not yet, but I, I like Dude. read the quotes, man. It's, it's pretty funny. It, it's pretty funny. Uh, it's even that's, more skating. What a gym that it. state is. My goodness. It keeps on giving, uh, but that's officially official. Uh, I, I, I like that. I think I've actually been on this guy's radio show, but cause I've been on ESPN upstate. I, I guess that's him. Uh, you talking about the the Florida State Clemson the, guy, the the Mark Ryan guy? Yeah, yeah. yeah. I'm pretty yeah. sure I've been on his show, and man, he is a he's a he, hot take artist by, dude, he, by everything I found out yesterday. I mean, when I was on going down to media days, he he kept asking me like basketball questions, like is Kentucky really a football school or basketball? Like, like one of the questions was, <laughs> is if, if the, if there was an attendance, wasn't a problem, who would draw more the football team or the basketball team? And I was just like, God, what a stupid ass question. But <laughs> I mean, like the, the sad part was that PFF ran with it. So you had some people who yeah. were like, Oh my gosh, it could happen. No, no. Uh, I don't think either of those That's are part of realignment Twitter. Realignment Twitter is a lot of fun, which this isn't realignment Twitter related, but like it, I need to hear your LSU take. You've got one that's in yeah, the oven. Man. Pull it out. Let's let, let let's enjoy it. You've let the cake bake. Let's let's feast. Okay, so Miles Brennan is ruled out for pretty much the year. Yesterday, their quarterback. Mm -hmm. um, so Max Johnson is going to be the starter. A lot of this is based on I thought Max Johnson was fine. I wasn't in love with Max Johnson last year. I went and pulled up their two deep projected two deep on offense, and it is not great. Like, looking at some of those guys, both the running backs have just been okay. Kayshawn Butte is a dope receiver. But after oh, that, it's blah. The offensive line's got some holes, I feel like. And, man, with that schedule they have, a tricky first game. Like, the more we get away from that national championship, the more it feels like the Gene Chizik auburn era. And I could just smell six and six. Like, I could just, like – I was looking at their depth chart and I just had a vision in my head of Chip Kelly, like running up and down the sidelines, fist pumping week one at the Rose bowl. <laughs> and like, man, I could just, I could just see it. Like now what's that said, their defense has got a chance to be awesome. Now they're bringing in a new coordinator or whatever. They got a, a hell of a cornerback tandem, a, two good pass rushers. And that's kind of the secret sauce on defense now, mm -hmm. but man, that offense, that, that, that would scare me if I was an LSU fan, just, you know, if, Butte has like a sophomore slump. Like, where do you get the offense from? And uh, like, I just, I mean, I could just see that. I could see it going, getting sideways for them. And that's wow. all I'm really going to say about that. And make, and like, they, they were kind of the, they were kind of a flavor of the month there at Media Days, Nick. I don't know if you noticed that. Like, there was a lot of people mm -hmm. predicting 10 and 2, 11 and 1 LSU, huge bounce back. And man, I don't know. We'll see. But that, that was kind of like my takeaway. Um, after after because I like Miles Brennan a lot, but not having him, I think it's a downgrade for Max Johnson to Max Johnson. Yeah, so a lot of a, that was baked into that, but yeah. It's an upgrade though when it comes to names because there's not a better name for a quarterback than Max yeah. Johnson. Like let's just like I want to live in a world that they lose that UCLA game just for the content. Because <laughs> after that, they they'll McNeese. I mean, it sounds like the Michigan. I mean it could be like the Mississippi State game again, you know? Yeah. And then the at Mississippi State, Auburn at home at Kentucky. So like they could lose that UCLA game and recover before they come to Kentucky. Um, but then the la last part of the schedule kind of gets tough. You're at Ole Miss, at Alabama, um, Arkansas at home, at A and M at home. So their schedule is not like super crazy bad. But like, I don't know, man. We'll see. I, we'll see. <sighs> It'd be I could just see it them coming into that game, and it could be like. The wheels have already fallen off. Well, we could, you know, it could be like that 2016 Kentucky Georgia game where it's like, you know, you know, Georgia had more talent, but you thought Kentucky was the better team at the time. And mm -hmm. you thought Kentucky should win the game. I could just see that that matchup in October being something like that. But we'll see. I mean, we'll have to see how it plays out. Man, could be a lot of fun. Yeah, could a lot, lot of it's fun a, for the cast. There's a lot going on around LSU. Like we've talked about that a few times. Um, but the Title IX investigation, 
their 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 uh, drug policy or their marijuana policy, whatever that is. <laughs> Guys transferring out. Um, though you know two new coordinators, a bunch of new guys on the staff. There's just a lot going on over there. So, mm-hmm. Man, and there's going to be a lot going on this preseason. This is our final edition of 11 personnel before the Cats get back in action, get back to it at preseason practice. And, man, if you thought we were fired up throughout this summer, which produced more news than normal, uh, man, I can't wait – Glad that August is finally here. Uh, You're going to be getting Tuesday, Thursday, Saturday practice updates and a lot more in between. So catch the football fever, folks. It's here, man. Like, I cannot, like, like, I cannot wait to watch um, Bielema beat Scott Frost. Like, that's another one I was talking myself into. I was like, man, Illinois has 40 seniors this year, Nick. (laughs) They had 18 super seniors return. Uh, that's incredible. I think like Kentucky gonna, has like six. <laughs> it's going to be like a bunch of 26-year-old old men from Illinois out there playing a Nebraska team that's got kind of transitioned a little bit, man. And, like, I could see, you know, you could just see Bielema and them, I guess, winning that game like 23-21 or something. Hell, they're all going to have Luffy Smith beards. Yeah. Like, they're just like 18 super seniors. Goodness you're like that tells me, like you know, those guys aren't any good, but they must love football. <laughs> and so, yeah, I'm excited. I just can't wait. And then, uh, then after that, we get you know everything else that comes with it. And hopefully, we can see a practice or two. Hopefully, fingers Knock crossed. Wood, fingers crossed. Well, we appreciate y'all listening to our podcast throughout this off season. Happy to have football back starting this weekend. And uh, if you see us out around the crow, come say hey. Don't be shy. We're friendly folk. So, we'll be out uh, and about for sure. Definitely be out and about between there, KS Bar and Grill. It's going to be a great place to stop after it's cool down, have some ice cold beers and s- s- some wings. So uh, very excited to, to bring you just the highest quality of content throughout this upcoming Kentucky football season. We'll be here for it all. So subscribe, rate, review, stick with us. We'll be back for more before you know it. Until then, go Cats, go Kroger.